so today I'm going to be talking about the work we've done over the last two years with a large injection of funding from the Hawaii Basin Species Committee, but also supported by um, USGS, NIFWF, American Bird Conservancy, the uh, Atherton Family Foundation. I'm sure I'm gonna forget somebody right now, but there, there's a, an acknowledgement slide at the end. So I just want to make everyone aware that work of this kind at the scale that we're doing it takes a lot of partners and we're really, really grateful for that partnership. So we're gonna be discussing what we're learning about changes in space and time in the distribution and abundance of the Culex mosquito um, with a view to informing uh, landscape level control of this pest. Um, why will it not let me advance? There we go. So to start with, I'll document the problem, why we care about mosquitoes, and it's because they're vectors of diseases that kill birds. I'm going to go over some previous studies and show how what we're doing now is advancing the state of knowledge over those previous studies, and then talk about the objectives, methods, and results for those studies. And there's there's two, two complementary studies, a 2019 study and a 2020 study, both funded by HIST, that I'm going to talk about today. And then I'll conclude with some summaries and some thoughts about our future directions. So somebody mute. There's like random noise in the background. Please. Oh, sorry, that's, that's probably me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think this audience is well aware of the challenges posed by mosquito-borne diseases. I wasn't entirely sure who the audience would be, so I prepared a slide to kind of cover the basics. But mosquitoes are introduced species in Hawaii. They came in whaling ships in the 1820s. Avian malaria followed 100 or so years later, and I think there have actually been multiple um, introductions of multiple different strains of avian malaria, some which are more virulent than others um, over the last 150 years. Our native honeycreepers share no evolutionary history with the pathogens that cause avian malaria. So they're highly susceptible to it. And therefore avian malaria has caused really dr drastic, drastic and, and dramatic um, species declines. Here on Kauai, what we are seeing in the honey creepers is an average of 11% population loss per species per year um, across the honey creeper family with some species suffering more notably than others. And we have worked to show that these declines do coincide with the spread of malaria throughout the island and those um, data are in two papers referenced at the bottom of this slide, and I can provide those to anyone who's interested. So on Kauai, um, the situation is, is more dire than on some of the other islands, especially than the Big Island because of Kauai's low elevation. So there's a, a very strong relationship between the development of both mosquitoes and the pathogen plasmodium. Um, and temperature. So neither mosquitoes nor plasmodium survive or reproduce at high temperature, or sorry, low temperatures. And as you know, temperatures drop as you climb up mountains. So on the Big Island, there's plenty of elevation and you, you reach this point, um, can you guys see my cursor? Um, shown by the, the yellow line where temperatures are too cool for mosquitoes and plasmodium to persist. Um, and then above that in this green zone, birds can flourish. This red line, the red dotted line represents what's happening with climate change. Um, the temperatures at which mosquitoes and plasmodium can reproduce um, are increasing, are moving up the, the island in elevation. And so there's less and less habitat left on the big island. On a lower ele elevation island like Kauai, we, the top of the island has always been at that critical temperature where mosquitoes and and plasmodium could not reproduce. So we've had a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of uh, mosquito free habitat at the very top of the island, which we call the Alakai Plateau. But with climate change, 
we predict that we will completely run out of habitat on Kauai for these species. The species that we're discussing at this point are eight remaining native species out of um, a couple of dozen of songbirds that originally colonized Kauai. Three of them are already listed as endangered, shown in that top bar, the Akeke'e, the Akikiki, which are both honeycreepers, and the Puayohi, which is a thrush and is likely less susceptible to malaria. And then the other um, native forest bird species um, are not listed as endangered, although e e the in red at the bottom, is now listed as threatened uh, since about three years ago. The Adianiao, the Kwai Alapayo, and the Kwai Amakihi, like the three endangered species on Kauai, are all endemic to Kauai, found nowhere else in the whole wild world. So this is a, a very grave problem. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about with the population trends of our two most endangered honey creepers, the Akikiki and the Akake. These graphs here are hot off the presses from a report that we prepared with USGS based on our 2018 population surveys. The red line that extends back further in time is the population trends in what we call the interior of these birds range. It's the sort of the core of the Alakai Plateau. And originally that was the only area that we surveyed with the forest bird transects. Since 2000, in order to get a better handle on what was going on with these very rare birds, we started surveying what we call the exterior, which is Coquet State Park and some other neighboring areas. And um, so we have a more robust data set since 2000. And that's why you see those multiple colors 2000 and later. But you can see that the addition of this, these exterior transects hasn't really helped us wrap our heads around Akikiki because since 2000, it's largely been absent from the exterior, which is Coquet State Park. And it's sort of barely hanging in there at about 500 birds in the interior of its range. And Akikei hung in a little bit longer in the exterior of its range. Um, it started with a more robust population size to begin with, and it's a little bit more tolerant of disturbance. But it has gone through a much more recent dramatic decline so that it is now also disappearing from the exterior of the range. You can only see a couple of birds he here and there in Coquet State Park. Um, and it numbers about a thousand birds in the interior of its range. So if we do nothing about mosquito-borne diseases and climate change, Lucas Fortini and his co-authors predicted that by um, 2100, we would lose four of those eight native species. And of the remaining four species would retract to what we do call the core, the high elevation, the highest elevation core or interior of the forest bird range under climate change, current climate change scenarios, which would predict that temperatures will continue to increase over the plateau and we will just run out of mosquito free habitat. So we have a plan, statewide we have a plan to use Wolbachia as mosquito birth control to try to stave off this grim future. Wolbachia bacteria naturally occur in insect populations, including mosquitoes. And for interesting intracellular reasons that I only barely wrap my head around, um, cross matings between females that carry different strains of Wolbachia lead to in cytoplasmic incompatibility. And so the female lays in viable eggs. And so essentially it's, as I said, it's a form of birth control. So this is shown here. If you breed two mosquitoes, male and female with Wolbachia blue, you end up with viable mosquitoes. But if you breed, breed Wolbachia red with Wolbachia blue mosquitoes, you end up with this massive inviable eggs. So our plan that we're working on assiduously with all of our partners is to, in the lab, inject non-biting males, so no male mosquitoes bite, um, with this different strain of Wolbachia from what the wild females are carrying and release enough of those 
lab injected males that they can usurp copulations with wild females. So in order for this to be effective, we need to know a whole lot about those wild mosquitoes. And that's where KFBRP comes in. What we have been doing over the last few years is figuring out where those wild mosquitoes are in space and time and how many of them there are so that we know how many of those wild ma uh, lab reared males we might need to release when where and when and how many that's the key question and that's why you need to know so much about wild mosquito populations and we have been focusing our work lately mostly on the alakai plateau which is the region shown in blue where the native forest birds continue to reside in those mostly cooler temperatures that are unfavorable to mosquitoes or at least that's what we were thinking before we did this work. So let me just summarize the state of knowledge before we did these two studies. In the 1990s, the USGS sur surveyed mosquito distribution at um, the Kwaikoi field site, which is shown up here in the north, and the Mohihi field site, which is midway along the plateau between Kwaikoi and Halapaakai. And they did that every quarter. And these were larval surveys with stream dips and cross country puddle dips. And they were also trapping adults using CO2 and gravid traps. In 2010, we used those same techniques at both quali, quali sorry, in, sorry, in 2011 and 2013, we did those same techniques at both um, Kwai Kwai and Halapakai, which is the core of the forest bird range. And when we compared our data to the USGS data, we noticed that more mosquito and larvae were being found in the 2010s. Um, that if we sample bird blood to see if they have been exposed to malaria using a PCR test, more and more birds had been exposed to malaria. So malaria was increasing on the plateau. Mosquitoes were increasing on the plateau in that time frame. Streams seem to be the primary source of larvae compared to upland puddles. And these findings were all consistent with the climate becoming warmer and drier and allowing for more standing water rather than water that was always being flushed out on the plateau um, during storm events. But the problem with these two studies is that we didn't have really good recent year round data. The, the most recent year round data was from the 1990s. And we also only have these couple of sites that we hit. We don't have a really good spatial extent of, of our surveys. So that's what we set out to address with the funding we got from HISC. In FY19, so that was um, the spring and summer of, twin, of 2019, we assessed the seasonal variation um, in adults and larvae at our Halapakai field site with really intensive surveys monthly. We also opportunistically sampled mosquitoes at sites across the plateau that ranged, um, that represented a range of elevations. We combined these intensive data from Halapakai with a USGS data set that covered the fall of eight of 2018. So we had a nice long year time series from 2018 to 2019 um, to really get a handle on seasonal variation in mosquito abundances. And then in 2020, we kind of did the opposite thing. We did a whole bunch of sites and we did them only in fall all across the plateau. And those sites represented north south transects, sort of, you'll see in a minute on the map. Um, on the western side of the plateau and the eastern side of the plateau, which also represent gradients of moisture and elevation. And it, we'll, I'll show you a map in a few slides that will explain that. The methods we used were the Biogent's CO2 trap that attracts host seeking mosquitoes, those mosquitoes that are looking for a blood meal that are attracted to the scent of humans and CO2 and be, Biogens has come up with this really stinky lure that the mosquitoes really seem to like. So capture rates have improved since 
our, we and our partners started using this kind of CO2 trap. We also used an active gravid trap, which has stinky water in the basin and is attractive to females that are looking for a place to lay their eggs. If they do go down to lay their eggs in that stinky water, there's a fan that sucks them up into the trap. So it's an active trap. These traps require a lot of attention nightly or every other night to change out batteries and CO2 and collect the mosquitoes. So in order to get a bigger longitudinal sample in 2020 only, we ran passive gat traps, which also use sticky water, but rather than mosquitoes being sucked up by a fan, they get stuck on a card like a fly trap. And so they're just there waiting to be collected a week later. So they're much less labor intensive. And then finally, we did larval dip surveys. You scoop up water and you look for the presence of larvae in them in still and calm water along the margins of streams or in puddles on overland transects. In 2019, we ran, and 2018, we ran 10 pairs of the BUG CO2 traps and the active gravid traps throughout Halapa'akai. Mostly they were based on the streams, but there were about four ridge, four ridge traps, I think. Um, these were run for four to eight nights every four to six weeks from September, 2018 to August of 2019. And we did bog and larval sur uh, stream larval surveys. When we did our opportunistic surveys across the plateau, we went to sites ranging in elevation from 500 to 1250 meters, as we could get access to them throughout the spring of 2019 from uh, March to July. And th in those cases, we ran four pairs of traps and they were only active three to four nights each. We did not do larval surveys. In 2020 on the, our Alakide wide scheme, we sampled six sites that range in elevation from almost 1100 meters to just over 1300 meters. Uh, we had four pairs of traps per site, mostly in streams, a few ridges here and there. This matters by the way, because ridges tend to be more windy and mosquitoes might not be able to na navigate to traps as easily. And also there might not be as much breeding habitat on ridges than as compared to streams. Uh, traps were run for three nights, twice over an 11 week period. So it was really short term and intensive, trying to eliminate the question of temporal variation between these sites and really focus on site level variation. Uh, we did both stream and overland larval surveys with those dips. And then at each of those sites, we also ran those GAT traps, three of them, which we checked weekly. So uh, now to the, the results for the 2019. So I hope you can see my cursor. So I'm gonna start down here at Halapakai, the orange triangles. So Halapakai was the site that we ran for that um, entire year long period. And these are those 10 traps. So these ones, um, and, and the, size in the, the size of the triangles in this map represent the number of mosquitoes captured and the color represents the month in which they were sampled. So here this orange represents the fact that Halapakai was sampled multiple times and the size of the triangles represent the fact that we caught a few mosquitoes there. Contrast that say with Wailai here in blue, which we ran in May and the triangles are much larger. So indicating that we caught quite a few more um, mosquitoes at Wailai compared to say Mohihi, which we sampled in July or Wainiha, which we sampled in March. Um, those are all very small triangles. We didn't, in March and early April when we were sampling um, Upper Lima Huli and Wainiha, we did not catch very many mosquitoes and we're not sure if it was just too early and too cold or if it was the fact that we by bad luck had really rainy weather those those two weeks it, it could be a comp it could be both of those things by um may we were in wildlife and lower coquet where we were catching lots of mosquitoes um, and then we had a rainy week in june which we when we didn't catch nearly as many 
So this is why we tried in 2020 to really focus on a narrow time window so we could really understand that variation in space rather than worrying about whether differences in captures were due to different differences in, in time and, and season. Um, in 2018 and 2019 at Halapakai, we caught almost all Culex um, in the BG CO2 traps, not in gravid traps. So I, there was only one Culex caught in gravid traps. So this graph here shows the BG rate of captures per trap night. And you can see that all fall of 2018, we were catching a number of Culex per trap per night. And then it really tailed off in that winter period, which is why I'm not entirely sure whether those sites that we sampled in, in March in that map I just showed you might just have been too cold because it was apparently too cold at Halapakai. Um, and then by summer, things started to tick up again. And by August, we were catching a lot of mosquitoes again. So this seasonality has been well documented before on Kauai where most captures happen in the fall months as temperatures get warmer and as rainfall decreases and we sort of settle into those fall doldrums that we get in the at the tail end of the hurricane season. Uh, we found one larval pool of Culex in February, surprisingly. So maybe those were larvae that were um, laid at the end of December. Um, this shows the distribution of those traps. Sorry, you guys, the mailman just came in. That was all my wild gesticulating. Um, this shows the distribution of traps at Halapa'akai with green representing the stream traps that caught the most mosquitoes. And this one here in particular is our LZ, which is a little stream meandering through a bog. And it caught far more mosquitoes than any other trap, 90, 95, um, during the fall of 2018. So, to, to summarize, let me just go back here. To summarize the 2019 results, definitely a fall peak um, at, at Halapakai with things starting to cook again in the late spring, definite variation in space, both at a big scale across the plateau and also a micro scale, scale within Halapakai where stream traps catch more than um, upland traps. So in, 2020, we used the data we'd collected over the last couple of decades and our sort of knowledge of the, of the area to come up with six sites that represented these gradients from north to south and east to west. So we have this sort of western transect from Coquay Park through Camp Tan Road to Wailai Cabin on the west side. And then on the east side, we have our Kwai Kwai Camp um, Kauai Stream at the Hunter's Cabin there and Halapakai again. This polygon here shows the range of Akikiki and this bigger beige polygon is sort of the general forest bird range for the common species like Apapane. So you can see that we sampled really well both the endangered species range and, and well into the common species range and have a nice dis distribution of study sites. This map gives you kind of an overview of the results I'm going to show in the next few slides where Camp 10 was the source of most of our captures, followed by Wailai. Uh, Camp 10 is the lowest elevation of all of the sites represented in 2020, and Wailai is the next uh, lowest in elevation, with Halapakai being the highest, um, Kokei being actually also fairly high, and Kwaikwe being moderate. Again, we saw the increase over the fall in capture rates. So I've organized in this graph, um, the study sites by elevation from low elevation to high elevation. And um, I've shown here the two visits we made to each site. So the first visit was the end of August through the third week of, 
September and into the fourth week of September. The second visit was the very tail end of September and all of October. And at most sites, there were pretty dramatic increases between the first visit and the second visit in the number of Culex we caught. This is in both beachy traps and um, active gravid traps combined. But you can see that the Camp 10 site, which is right at the very end of Camp 10 Road as it comes down to Mohihi Stream, had by far and away more mosquitoes than, than any other site. Um, followed by Wailai, which is a cabin on Wailai stream that is um, favored by hunters and horse packers. The good news is that um, these high elevation sites, Koke'e and, and Halapakai, are still seeing relatively fewer mosquitoes than other sites. And we do have good native bird populations in both those areas. Again, as we've seen with other studies, the BG traps catch far more mosquitoes than the gravid, active gravid traps do. Um, interestingly, at Kwaikoi, both the active gravid and the passive gravid traps caught quite uh, relatively more mosquitoes than anywhere else. And I'm not entirely sure why, because this is right along the stream and, and right in a boggy area where it seems like there's lots of other breeding habitats. So I'm, I'm not really sure why our gravid traps catch so many mosquitoes at that site. But this is consistent with the work that we did in 2013 when we caught quite a few mosquitoes and gravid traps there too. So the idea of running the GAT traps is they were checked weekly at every site. So they were sort of like keeping our finger on the pulse um, of these sites. So, so every week we had some measure of the mosquito activity at these sites, whereas the other trapping was done every six weeks. So it was a little bit more on and off. And these, these GAT traps were trying to give us this big picture of what mosquito populations were doing at each site as we, we came and went with them with the more active sites. And so, you can see that um, all of these lower lines are everything but um, coquet. This big tall, uh, sorry, Kwaikwe. This big tall gray line is that Kwaikwe site, which also had the, the highest number of captures in gravid traps the, of the active kind. So there's something going on there with breeding mosquitoes or, or ones that are looking to lay their eggs at Kwaikwe that is not happening at the other sites. But it does correspond to this period of time in which our abundances of mosquitoes overall ticked up. It also, we noticed, um, this is also quite quite earlier in the year. So it is really the only site where the mosquitoes were really attracted to that of a position site. The larval surveys, let me go through this. Um, table with you. So the Camp 10 Road site um, had larvae in puddles on both um, visits, the, the September, the late August, early September visit and the October visit, and large numbers of larvae. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, this column here is Culex. And then there's, we also found fair numbers of 80s larvae in rock pools. Um, the second highest or lowest elevation site, Wailai, also had fair numbers of larvae, but they were 80s, not Culex. The Kwaikwe site where the mosquitoes were attracted to the gravid traps also had some Culex larvae. And then both Kwaye and Halapakai had some numbers of, of 80s larvae. The interesting thing about this is that we hardly ever found larvae on those stream surveys, which is completely different than previous results, which only found larvae on stream surveys and not on upland surveys. Our larvae were found opportunistically when we were walking along roads, or we were walking cross country. Also, in line with the seasonality that we saw, with the trapping data, the larvae were found mostly on that second visit, not on the first visit. So there was definitely a ramping up over the fall in mosquito activity. At 
uh, Camp 10, the mosquitoes were found in these ruts in the road at the very end of Camp 10 Road, primarily on the lower road that was constructed to maintain the sugarcane ditch. Interestingly, they were not often found in the sugarcane ditch, which has intermittent flow. Um, and so we were worried that that was going to be a source of mosquitoes, but it wasn't really. And only two street, and then on Kwaikwe, they were found in these bogs next to the boardwalk. And then on YLI and Kauai, the rock pools stream surveys did have some larvae of 80s japonicus. So to summarize all of that, captures mostly occurred in our BGCO2 traps. So these are females looking for a blood meal, not females ready to lay yet. And they mostly occurred near streams and bogs as far as the captures went. However, um, when we did find larvae, which was rare, they were mostly not in streams. They were in bogs or in upland sites. So, and that contrasts with previous work and has management implications. Previously, we thought that larvae were mostly found in streams and it's really hard to think of ways to mechanically or chemically, for example, using um, biopesticides like Bt um, or anything else, control larvae in streams because streams are flowing all the time. But it might be a lot easier for us to manage larvae in ruts and roads, for example, by improving the quality of the road. Or if we're doing work along the boardwalk, maybe we think about how the boardwalk's um, placement or structure might cause puddles or alleviate puddles. And we might be able to do a lot to reduce the amount of breeding habitat if these upland situations are becoming more important in the larval cycle. So the interesting thing that we always talk about here in Kauai is we keep finding large numbers of mosquitoes searching for blood meals, but we don't find that many mosquitoes in the gravid traps looking to lay. And we don't find usually that many larvae other than in that, those, those tire ruts. So is the breeding cycle of mosquitoes on the plateau incomplete? Mosquitoes move up here, seek the blood meal, and then for some reason just can't complete the breeding cycle. They don't, they don't lay, the larvae don't hatch. Or is there so much breeding habitat on the plateau that it's like looking for a needle in the haystack, both for us and for the mosquitoes. They don't, they don't need to come to our traps because there's so many other places they can lay and we don't find them because there's so many places they can lay. And one of the ways that we're looking at this question is with genomic and isotopic lab work, which will help us identify source populations of mosquitoes. It, they will help us determine whether or not the mosquitoes on the plateau come from the plateau or whether they come from low elevation populations of mosquitoes, say from Wailua or Lihui or Hanapepe that migrate up the hill. So that's a major avenue of work that is ongoing with our partners uh, at USGS and, and, and NAU. Another thing we have learned is that we, as expected, have more culex at our lower sites and our more Western sites. The fact that they, it's hard to separate out whether the Western part of it is, is just a consequence of being lower elevation or if that actually helps illuminate the migration pathway that, that mosquitoes are moving their way up the uh, Waimea River and into those lower elevation west sites which comes first, the west or the low elevation. And it's likely that it's the low elevation that's driving that because that of the relationship between temperature and elevation. The relative abundance of mosquitoes is still low over the winter and the early spring at the vast majority of our sites. We do start to see upticks in mosquito activity in April at 
some of our lower elevation sites. And then on the plateau itself, the cycle really begins to ramp up in August and continues through October and into November. And so all of this has really important implications for when and how we manage mosquitoes. We would target lower elevation sites early in the season and higher elevation sites later in the season to make sure we were usurping all of those copulations with our lab injected males. However, we have these freak events. So even though during our actual official studies, we caught hardly any Culex overall at Holopakai, in June of this year, my staff started complaining about being kept awake at night by mosquitoes. And so we opportunistically ran traps, just a couple of traps for a few nights. And we caught more mosquitoes in those few nights than at any other time during our official studies. And so what I want people to think about is the press versus the pulse kind of idea. If we've been doing studies that identify presses and mosquitoes like long-term trends, but if you have a pulse event, like a huge stochastic event, that might be all it takes to topple or you know, the last straw of the camel's back, topple the dynamics. All it needs is a few hundred mosquitoes in Halapakai for a few weeks in June to come in contact with all of the breeding honey creepers and all of their offspring that have just been born to turn the trajectory in a downwise ways in a, in a, you know, badly. And we don't know how often this kind of thing happens. It's the first year in the 10 years I've been managing the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project that we've had these kind of complaints with staff just been able, unable to sleep at, so sleep at night. So maybe it's just a one-off event, but you don't need very many of these one-off events to really change the game. And so for me, this means that we need to be ready at any time to do a release of those mosquitoes whenever people come up with a report of unexpectedly high mosquito levels. And we also just need to have some kind of sentinel monitoring so, going on across the plateau. So early, morning, early warning signals so that we know when to expect that. And Lucas Fortini just published a model with temperature forecasts that might help us do that, but we probably also need something on the ground. So where are we going with all this? We are continuing to sample opportunistically to help inform the genetic, uh, the genomic and the isotopic work. My staff has been sampling at their houses here at low elevations to provide those mosquitoes for con contrasting and comparing with the high elevation mosquitoes with lab techniques. We have sent off all of those mosquitoes and they have been, the, their DNA has been extracted by USGS and we are beginning to look at also malarial prevalence um, in, those, in the DNA of those samples. Next year, we will be doing year round surveys again at three sites, which we will choose from the results I have just presented to you to be kind of the biggest bang for our buck. Probably that Camp 10 site, probably Halapakai representing the Forest Bird Range, and then maybe, and then one other TBD. And we will put all these data together to help managers determine when and where landscape level control will be most effective to control mosquitoes. As I said, there are a lot of partners behind this effort. They've been involved financially. They've been involved with advice and expertise and equipment. They have provided a lot of logistical support and access to sites. And then there have been countless techs and volunteers that have spent the days and nights out there collecting all the data. <clears throat> and we thank them for that. And I also just wanna point out that um, all the data analysis that went into this talk was performed by, <clears throat> excuse me, an intern that we hired with CARES Act funding. So there has been an upside to the pandemic um, and my data technician here on permanent staff. And I really need to thank them for providing all the slides I needed for this talk. And with that, I think I can take some questions. 